Hello friends of Jungle Drum Radio, my name is Lars Schall, I am an independent financial journalist from the Ruhr area and I am now connected with Pepe Escobar in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hi Pepe. Hi Lars, great to be with you, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Well, um, the topic of today is um, something like, quote unquote, with Pepe Escobar in Afpak 2001. And the first question would be, why and when did you become interested in what you've dubbed Pipelinistan? Well, that started already in the late 90s, because I was following a very important story at the time, which was uh, in Afghanistan, the main interest for the Americans to have a relationship with the Taliban was to build a pipeline. And at the time was the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan pipeline. At the time was called TAP. Uh, India was not part of it, only later. And obviously, back and forth, the Taliban were wined and dined. They were taken to Houston. The Americans wanted to cut a deal with the Taliban, but they were haggling about transit fees. So this was going on through the second part of the, uh, the second term of the Clinton administration. After 9-11, I got even more interested because I was following this story, another story, which is the construction of the Baku, Tbilisi, Seyhan, BTC pipeline, Azerbaijan through Georgia and then to Turkey, to Europe, which was a big Brzezinski idea, by the way. He went to Baku himself to sell this idea to the Azerbaijanis. Yeah, he was an this advisor all... of uh, British Petroleum, BP. He was an advisor of BP, which... Uh, May, uh, maybe a lot of people in Europe don't know. BP basically runs Azerbaijan, not only because of the pipeline, because they have the best deals with the local uh, oil company. Uh, and obviously they run, they run Azerbaijan practically as a fiefdom. They, uh, with the Aliyev uh, ruling dynasty, they always were very, very close to say the least. So following this story in Afghanistan, following this story in the from the Caspian Sea to Turkey. And then I started to uh, travel uh, along the areas where these pipelines and these pipelines to be would be built. This means uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, basically Central Asia and the Caucasus. And I was visiting all these countries involved in uh, pipelines uh, and future pipelines. Uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, I crossed the Caspian a few times. Uh, and obviously the destination would be India, which aligned to the US wanted to have uh, cheap gas, but the solution through Afghanistan nobody wanted because they knew it would be very hard to build. The BTC was the beginning of the American uh, policy of trying to bypass, at the same time, Russia and Iran. So it's crazy. They built a pipeline that at the time cost uh, five to six billion dollars just to bypass Iran and not buy gas from Iran. When if they had built a pipeline from Iran, it would have cost like 700 or 800 million maximum. So then I started to travel in all these lands that I call pipeline is done, basically from Central Asia to the Caucasus, following the American policy of bypassing Russia and China and the coups and counter coups by the countries in the area and the progressive uh, uh, not interference, but profiting from China of this whole situation, which only happened in the past few years. Yeah. Um, coming back to TAPI or TAP, this pipeline from Turkmenistan via Afghanistan and Pakistan to India, uh, was Washington or had Washington the plan to use the Taliban as uh, pipeline police? Oh yes, in fact, uh, they didn't care about the Taliban. Uh, from ni 1996, uh, a lot of uh, Clinton administration officials, they were saying, okay, these are tower heads, they are crazy walkers, but we can do business with them. The only interesting fact was they didn't care about human rights violations, they didn't care that the Taliban installed uh, 7th century style emirate in Afghanistan, which was absolutely horrible. Uh, I traveled there as a journalist from from the east, uh, the Pakistani border, to the west, the Iranian border, and I had never seen that 
anywhere in the world. It was back to 7th century Islam, or their interpretation of Islam, of course. Mm -hmm. But the Americans didn't care. They wanted to build a pipeline. So uh, they talked to uh, the leader of Turkmenistan at the time, the fabulous uh, Sapar Murad Niyazov, uh, the ruler, uh, supreme ruler of, uh, of uh, Turkmenistan. They had Musharraf on board. Uh, also called Busharaf uh, in, by uh, what 90% of the Pakistanis and they needed a stable government in Afghanistan. So after the Taliban and after 9-11 when they installed their puppet Hamid Karzai, they had the three guys that they needed to talk to to pull this off. So, very important December 2001 there was a meeting between Niazov, Hamid Karzai and Musharraf and they signed the uh, memorandum of understanding to build TAP. At the time, it was not TAPI. There was no India. So obviously, afterwards, everything unraveled because there was the Taliban resistance, and you simply could not get financing, which would be basically from uh, the Asian Development Bank, which is essentially a U.S.-Japanese racket that controls. It's a sort of mini World Bank for Asia controlled by the U.S. and Japan. They will never finance a pipeline in a war zone. Everybody knew that. And at the same time, they started to move the possibility of extending it to India as well, which would be an icebreaker in Pakistani-India relations as well. But all the time, in the background of the 9-11, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, America in uh, Central Asia story, there was the number one imperative was to build this pipeline. <laughs> when we look at the situation now, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, nothing happened. And they're still promising, oh, now that we have a new government in Afghanistan, finally we're going to build TAPI. And the costs, of course, spiraled out of control. And they still will face the same problem if this is ever built. They're going to uh, cro cut across a war area in Western Afghanistan, and the Taliban simply won't allow this pipeline to be uh, built in areas that they still control and that they'll keep control. A competitor of this pipeline would be a pipeline that would be built from Iran to Pakistan. Do you think that pipeline would be built before TAP would be built? Well, this is uh, one of these uh, pipeline stun uh, dramas that I have been following for years, in fact. And it is completely crazy. Because until, what, maybe two years ago, uh, there was the impression that uh, Iran-Pakistan, the IP pipeline, would be built before TAP or TAPI. Because the Iranians, they have built their stretch uh, as far as the Iran-Paki border in uh, southeast Iran and Baluchistan in, in Pakistan. The problem is the Pakistanis have no money. So the Iranians said, okay, we'll give you $500 million so you can build your stretch. And then the Pakistanis start to receive what else? Even more pressure from the Obama administration, following the pressure that they received before from Bush 1 and Bush 2. So now this whole thing is stalled once again. So the Iranians are saying, okay, if... Uh, if we don't build the Pakistani side, that there's no obviously there's no deal, it, and it's your problem. We can sell our gas uh, to somebody else now or in the future. And the same thing in the, there is a, also a problem in the Pakistani side because this pipeline in Baluchistan will traverse an area that is very much in conflict, in direct conflict with Islamabad. There are at least two uh, Baluchistan independent movements. They are always complaining that they are neglected by Islamabad. Uh, they are rich in uh, oil themselves, but all the oil that is extracted over there, the most of what eighty percent, ninety percent of the of the funds stay in Islamabad and don't go back to the province Baluchistan, which is a very poor province. So both pipelines at the moment are stalled. And obviously, who's losing in all this? And they desperately need the energy. Pakistan. And the Indians, they are thinking about maybe another mechanism uh, with Iran. But, uh, it, but it's very hard because they cannot do it bypassing Pakistan as well. So the situation at the moment is very murky. And still, since, it's crazy. Since 
late night since 1996 when these negotiations started like 18 years later almost 19 we still don't have a pipeline either from turkmenistan or from iran benefiting both pakistan and india coming back to the year 2001 in the summer of that year you've met ahmad shah Massoud, the leader of the so-called northern alliance who was murdered shortly before 9 11. later on you wrote did Washington know in advance that an Al-Qaeda connection would kill Afghan nationalist commander Ahmad Shah Massoud, aka the Lion of the Panjshir, only two days before 9-11? Massoud was fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, helped by Russia and Iran. According to the Northern Alliance, Massoud was killed by an ISI Taliban Al-Qaeda axis. If still alive, he would never have allowed the US to rig a Loya Riga Grand Council in Afghanistan and install a puppet, former CIA asset Hamid Kazai, as a leader of the country. Please explain. Well, the second part is the most important thing, uh, Lars, in, yeah. in my opinion, because uh, if uh, Massoud was alive, he would have repelled the Taliban by himself. That's what he was doing when I met him in August uh, 2001. He controlled only three provinces in northern Afghanistan, but he was receiving help from Iran and Russia. Probably this help would be in the medium to short to medium term would be and and he would be able to repel the, the Taliban. And even with some help from the Americans, considering that they wanted to fight uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda as well. The, the fact that he was killed two days before 9-11 was a godsend for the Americans because they got rid of uh, Afghan nationalists that would never agree to what the Americans did afterwards. They sidelined King Zahir Shah, which the Afghans were sure would return to Afghanistan to rule again, and they installed their own puppet, Hamid Karzai, with American connections. Uh, the first part is more complicated because uh, what Massoud told me at the time is that there was this uh, unholy alliance of uh, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the ISI, Pakistani intelligence. They wanted to rule Afghanistan, control Afghanistan as part of their strategic death doctrine, which is at the time was the military intelligence doc doctrine by Pakistan. Uh, what 9-11 changes that Musharraf uh, had to change uh, sides, otherwise he would be decimated or Pakistan would be, as the Americans said, would be bombed out back to, to the Middle Ages. Uh, Osama bin Laden and al they escaped and they were being hunted. Uh, Afghanistan disintegrated completely, but they had, the Americans had a puppet. So the Americans advanced their agenda of being based directly inside Afghanistan. For them it was perfect, because according to the neocons, if they were inside Afghanistan, they would be able to control v from Afghanistan most of Central Asia and interfere with Western China as well. Uh, with the allies allied with some Uyghur independentist movement. So what uh, Massoud was uh, visualizing three weeks before he was assassinated, in fact, was a completely different scenario where Afghanistan would be independent, ruled by a, a, a nationalist. Uh, they would, in the end, defeat the Taliban, helped by Iran and Russia. It would be a completely different situation. But in the end, we got the American uh, uh, supremacist uh, historical take at the time. But we all know how the blowback worked. And when we look at Afghanistan today, the Americans are out, but they're still in. Uh, Al-Qaeda is completely out. Uh, there's no space for Afghan nationalism, but at the same time, Russia and China, they have a, an increasing more powerful economic presence inside Afghanistan as well. So it's not exactly what the America, what the neocon Americans were thinking in 2001. Mm -hmm. Has Osama bin Laden been a major topic in 2001 in Afghanistan when you were there? A major what? I'm sorry. A major topic. Or a problem, uh, or a, a, a point of discussion. 
Well, which one? Uh, the, the rule of the Taliban? Osama. Ah, Osama. Yeah. So, no, Osama was more or less sidelined, in fact. Uh, it was crazy because he was living in Kandahar at the time. He was married to one of Mullah Omar's daughters. But there was uh, uh, an uneasy relationship because the Taliban were afraid that uh, the Americans would sooner or later do something inside the country to snatch Obama, uh, sorry, snatch Osama and complicate Taliban rule inside Afghanistan. This was the situation two weeks before 9-11, in fact. When I, when I came back from Afghanistan, I stopped in Peshawar, the capital of the tribal areas. And in Peshawar, I learned that uh, the Americans wanted to infiltrate a commando to snatch Osama in Kandahar. And Musharraf said no. Obviously, he said no because he was in uh, ISI, the Pakistan intelligence. They were in contact with the Taliban as well. So they both <laughs> vetoed the American plan. And Musharraf's excuse to the Americans was, if I do this, there's going to be a, a civil war in Pakistan the same day. I'm allowing new guys to traverse Pakistani territory, go into Afghanistan to mount an operation inside Afghanistan. Yeah. So, but Osama at the time was more or less silent. He was not, uh, he was not a very important character. He was important in terms of uh, people in Pakistan who support extreme medievalist versions of Islam would support Osama. But it's not, it was far from being the majority of the population. In fact, in Peshawar itself, yes, because Peshawar, a lot of hardcore jihadis and Taliban, they always circulate through Peshawar, which is a kind of a, 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 a room of Pakistan. All, lo, all roads converge to Peshawar. Uh, I even bought a, a fantastic T-shirt in Peshawar market uh, with, uh, with the effigy of Osama and the king of the Mujahids. This was, what, 10 days before 9-11, in fact. But after 9-11, the prestige of, Obama, of Osama inside uh, Pakistan soared. Absolutely. And even people who are secular, they were supporting him because they were not convinced that he had organized 9-11. And they saw America once again as a bullying and bombing empire of chaos mode. Uh, how did you learn about the fact that 9-11 happened? Well, I, I left uh, Afghanistan at the end of August, went to Peshawar, then Karachi, then South Africa. And I came back to Brazil to write a series of articles about my stay in Afghanistan in August. There was a lot of stuff to write about. Uh, Masood's prisons, uh, the war in the front lines, what was happening in Bagram Air Base, uh, an interview with Masood, an interview with commanders uh, uh, working for Masood, etc. While I was doing this, I received an email on uh, September 9th. And the email said, it was very cryptic, the commander has been hit. But they didn't say that he had died because there was a gag order by the North and Alliance. They couldn't tell anybody that Masood had been assassinated the same day. So I was trying to get in touch with them. Very complicated communications with, with Afghanistan. Very complicated all, always. You sat phone, you name it. And then two days later, of course, uh, in fact, a day and a half later, uh, if you consider the time zones, 9-11 happened. I was in, in, uh, in Sao Paulo. I looked at the TV. My first reaction was Masood was sort of visualizing something like this. So it has to be Al-Qaeda. Of course, we didn't have any proof. We didn't know. Uh, CNN, of course, knew because, <laughs> because it took them two hours to blame Al-Qaeda. <laughs> you know, yeah. we all remember the story, right? So one week after that, I was back in Karachi, in Peshawar, in Islamabad, and then I stayed there, and then I moved back to Afghanistan. So I, I, I spent half of 2001 between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, is the war on terror that followed 9-11 a disaster? And if you are um, answering this question, does the answer depend on which end of the gas pump you are standing? It depends on which end of the gas pump. It depends on uh, if you have a short-term perspective, which is, uh, let's say, the past decade, or if you're thinking in terms of uh, the war on terror being perpetuated by uh, the Washington elites for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And don't forget that everything that you hear from the Pentagon 
especially related to what's happening in Syria and Iraq, they say this is going to be a long war all over again. When you compare what they're saying now to what they were saying in 2001, when the concept of the long war was sold by the Pentagon to the rest of the world, uh, it's the war on terror and it's the long war. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing has changed, in fact. It is uh, a gift that keeps on giving, self-perpetuating, uh, along this enormous arc, which the Pentagon itself defines as arc of instability, which is from the Maghreb in Northern Africa, across the Middle East, across parts of Central Asia, all the way to the w Western borderlands in China. And it's not it's not going to stop because we still have American troops and American influence all over this area. And the Pentagon doesn't want to abandon American military influence in the arc of instability. So if there is no instability, they create a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you um, describe 9-11? I, for example, describe it uh, rather as an attack on the collective psyche of the West. That's a very good definition. Uh, I remember that uh, Baudrillard at the time uh, defined it as a, a spectacular work of art as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of how it accomplished. In fact, he, uh, Schomburg was the first who said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And the, exactly. And, uh, Schomburg, no, Stockhausen, sorry. Yeah, Stockhausen. Yeah. And then he, Baudrillard, used what Stockhausen said and he conceptualized in terms of uh, uh, an event that never happened. It was a unique work of art. If you think of the intricacies of pulling off 9-11, yes, we can say that. But it was a... a uh, wh whoever conceived it, uh, I'm still open to all possible uh, stories or narratives that give us a coherent narrative of what happened in 9-11. We still don't know what really happened, period. That's the bottom line. But whoever pulled it off, it was certainly... Uh, the way the, the aesthetic experience was organized, it was an attack on the collective conscience of the West. There's absolutely no question about it. But to what ends? To provoke even more chaos, uh, to perpetuate a war on terror forever, in fact, or, or if, if, if it was really pulled by Islamic radicals, they thought that this would annihilate the West psychologically for decades or centuries to come. Hmm. That's what we still don't know, because we still don't know exactly who pulled it off and the real motivation behind 9-11. Yeah, I, I see it uh, the same as you, but if we don't know what happened on that day, why it happened, who were the perpetrators and so on, but nevertheless, we are um, uh, we are doing wars because of it. Uh, what does this tell you? What tells us is that uh, uh, the Western system, especially, uh, is always on a war mongering um, mode. In fact, uh, as I call it, the empire of chaos mode. Uh, provoking more chaos, being a hit by a chaos blowback. But basically, the logic is confrontational and a warmongering logic. Assuming that this was pulled by a bunch of Islamic radicals, a Western reaction would be, okay, let's try to, fi uh, to fight the, the motiva their motivations. Let's try to in fact, establish a dialogue of civilization so this would never happen again. Let's try to prove them that uh, we don't want to antagonize them and treat them as second class or third class. And uh, we can have an understanding between uh, major monotheistic religions, between the Western system of liberal democracy and an Islamic system ruled by Sharia law. Let's put it this way. Uh, dialogue instead of bombing. Obviously, this is a very romantic position and very unrealistic, I, I agree. But it could have been the West's plan B to deal with 9-11. And instead, we had total hysteria. We had a logic of bombing, coercing, and even bombing places that had nothing to do with 9-11, which was the Iraqi horror.
terrible Iraqi adventure nightmare, which is the destruction of a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. And of course, antagonizing, I would say, huge swathes of uh, Islamic lands all over the world. So this proves once again that uh, the people who, the, the the Western elites, the people who run our system, they have no interest in dialogue with uh, the other. So we should uh, talk <laughs> in Claude de Lévy-Strauss terms once again. The West does not understand the other and does not want to understand the other. Uh, as long as you can gain a lot of money uh, from it. Oh yes, you're right, Lars. As long as you can profit from the other. <laughs> Yeah, and w would you say that that, that the um, military-industrial complex in the U.S. is a huge beneficiary of the war on terror? Um, sectors of it. This is yeah. not uh, Was Washington is not a homogeneous entity or the Beltway in general. Yeah. A few sectors of the industrial military complex, of course, especially the weaponizing sector and defense contractors, they profited handsomely all over the spectrum and they will continue to profit handsomely and instigating more wars and more bombing via their media shields very well placed in American corporate media. There's no question. And of course, the, in terms of the revolving door in Washington, many neocons and many uh, humanitarian libertarians that are part of the Clinton system, they also have very good connections with the industrial military complex, or some of them do the revolving door. Uh, that's the case of our new uh, Pentagon head. He's a typical example of a, a Washington apparatchik. He's uh, between academia, government, and industrial military complex, and the Pentagon. So this is not going to change. But it's not uh, all over the place. Uh, there are many very good analysts inside the industrial military complex that, that they know, for instance, nowadays, that it's crazy to pick a war simultaneously with both Russia and China, which mm -hmm. the U.S. would never win. And this is the real war. This is not the war on terror. The real war from the uh, perspective of, uh, of the Washington elites is to fight the only two emerging powers who can face the U.S. And in case of Russia, stare down the U.S. because of their nuclear capabilities, uh, missile strike capabilities. Uh, militarily, China is still building their response to the U.S. Yes. I would say China by 2025 is going to be a formidable military power as well. Mm -hmm. um, Especially in terms of submarines, uh, new fighter jets, missile systems. They are building it little by little. <laughs> yeah, but, but what does this tell you that the military industrial complex in the U.S. is so huge? I mean, they only create things that can destroy but not can, cannot create anything good. It's true. It's true because it's uh, it's the same thing. Uh, the uh, the logic is of maintaining uh, a monopoly, uh, the myth of a unilateral exceptionalist power that rules the world, imposing their own version of order and progress and unity. So you have to coerce vassals all over the world, intimidate them, and if they don't behave, you have to go there and bomb them. Or in the case of Iraq, the famous slogan at the time, bomb them into democracy, which was the American uh, Western liberalism version of, uh, of American democracy. Uh, it's not a, 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 a benign empire, which is a no, also another myth mm -hmm. circulated in the U.S. all the time. Yeah. A benign empire that spreads not only democracy, but uh, well-being for many peoples around the world. Not at all. This is the official rhetoric. In practice, well, there number one arm is the industrial military complex. They also have the financial uh, turbo capitalism, neoliberalism, casino capitalism arm as well, which is to inflict havoc all over the world if you don't comply with uh, their greedy agenda, in fact, or countries that disobey what they're doing, they can uh, wreak havoc financially, even more than militarily against these countries. So it is, it is a divide and rule predatory enterprise when you look at it. 
Th there's absolutely no way around it. And uh, the problem is since the end of the Second World War, Europe is basically an appendix to it. And the means of domination, essentially, is NATO. Yeah. If Europe doesn't get rid of NATO, Europe will always be a midget politically, not only in Europe, but all, all, all over the world. And the developing world, they see it clearly. Uh, the Russian, uh, Indian, uh, Brazilian, Indonesian, South Korean elites, they know this very, they, they know this very, very well. So that's why they don't respect Europe politically anywhere. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Uh, you and I, we both have been in uh, in the U.S. And we know that uh, the U.S. is a very religious country. But would you say, spiritual-wise, America is dead? Well, uh, one thing is uh, religious... Uh, they are, uh, mo in terms of a uh, monotheist religion that explains everything, oh yes, they are... Uh, Yeah. It's it's a huge, a deeply Christian country, believing in all sorts of myths peddled by Christianity, and obviously considering other religions, uh, other religions lesser uh, religions in itself, or maybe lesser evils, <laughs> according to many of their uh, hardcore predictioners. But spiritually, there is a void, a complete void, because. Uh, materialism, as it has been carried by the U.S. Uh, over these past few decades, especially after the end of the Second World War, decimated society. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, implode the, the 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 family tissue, the social tissue was imploded by this uh, extreme circus mentality, of course, fueled by unbridled materialism. So you, you can say that spiritually, most of the country is actually dead. Even though you have pockets of excellence all across the U.S., it never ceases to amaze me and inspire me that you find people who are attracted to Eastern religions or they are Buddhists in disguise or that they are really true American pacifists, you know, very long pacifist tradition. But these are pockets. Most of the country, they are anesthetized. Yeah. And now the fact that the middle classes are disappearing very fast all across the U.S., not only they are in this desire, but even worse, they fear everything uh, in terms of their future. They won't have a job, the, their house will be repossessed, the car will be repossessed, they won't be able to pay their credit card bills, they, can, they won't be able to send their sons and daughters to college, absolutely, out of the question. So they, they only see fear around them. And obviously the ruling elites, they can manipulate fear from all over the world, be it uh, Daesh, ISIS, ISIL, Al-Qaeda, you know, evil commies, uh, the Russians are back, the evil Chinese, you name it, to deviate the attention of the bulk of the population. And now they're having problems to survive in America, in fact, which is something that it hasn't happened until the past decade. Uh, those years of abundance in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, now it's over. Yep. And for them, this is a, they simply cannot deal with it because they, they are not equipped to deal with it. Because you will have to, the whole narrative of the American dream will have to change. And they are not mentally, psychologically equipped to change the narrative towards a more realist narrative of the future of America. Do you think that Alex Jones is uh, putting it right in a way when he says, you know the slogan, uh, there's a war going on for your mind? Do you think this is really what it's all about? We could, we could say that in global terms, Lars. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a global war for the minds of the, the global population, in fact, uh, concerning... Uh, our immediate future and the future of the planet as a whole. When, when we look at the possibility, the horrible possibilities for until the end of this century, in fact, if we go on like this, with this uh, uh, economic system, or uh, as Wallerstein would say, world system that is uh, imploding all the time, all over the place, with no uh, substitute system on the horizon, with the possibility of... Uh, Sooner or later, we could have a major war caused exactly by the decline of the empire 
trying to fight its own decline and trying to postpone its decline via war. It's, it's absolutely terrifying when you look at it. So, uh, and obviously most people in the developing world, they still have hope because they are, they are now entering uh, the market, let's put it this way, or at least entering uh, living as not a second or third class citizens. I'm talking about the new middle classes in all developing, big developing countries, especially in Russia, in China, in India, in Brazil, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, all these countries, and so Argentina, South America as a whole, you name it. They, they have hope because they, their lives can get better even if the worse is getting worse, the world is getting worse. But in terms of the, the middle classes of the West who enjoyed peace, <laughs> peace, not, not exactly peace, but sort of peace and prosperity for the past 30, 40, 50 years, they know that their sons and daughters are going to fight a war, find and fight a world that's going to be extremely nasty, like the return of Leviathan on a, on a global basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for this interview. Thanks, Lars. Great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.